Hi, everyone. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I have the privilege today of visiting with Dr. Pawa Kahambu, a National Geographic explorer and wildlife conservationist, as well as the producer and co-star of the four-part National Geographic documentary series, Secrets of the Elephants. Dr. Kahambu, it's a pleasure to have you here, live and direct from Nairobi. Uh, your series is so visually stunning. How did you and the Nat Geo team get the kind of access necessary to generate such amazing footage on this show? Well, you know, a series like this takes years in planning and National Geographic supports conservationists around the world and in Africa and Asia in particular, we have many explorers who work on elephants, experts who are part of our networks. I've been associated with National Geographic for more than 10 years and um, the 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 amazing access that you see is uh, thanks to you know hours and hours of uh, or hundreds of hours of research to find out where the best locations are who are the most knowledgeable people on the ground and what kind of things are happening and when you know it's hard to it's hard to get anything right you know if you're filming elephants in the desert finding them is very unpredictable so it also means spending enormous amounts of time in areas where you know elephants might pass by and then staying with them for months on end to capture that incredible footage. Oh, and my God, just that in that first part to see the elephants, you know, very so precariously having to navigate the cliff and go down with their babies. Um, I, I, you know, your heart is in your throat. I mean, I, I, I imagine, well, there isn't gonna be a horrible disaster here probably, or they wouldn't have included it in the series, but even so, it's such it's such drama in real life, and uh, you realize that nothing is guaranteed for these for these beasts. Very true. Uh, I think for me, the most amazing thing as somebody who studied elephants for a very long time, to see these elephants um, solving a problem, finding their way down very very steep cliffs with crumbling rocks, um, they have to do it so carefully because all it would take is for one elephant to slip, and it will roll into all the others and the whole lot of them will tumble down and many of them would probably die. The fact that they are so good at it means that they have perfected this for generations and they've passed on that knowledge from generation to generation. And you see this with the youngsters, the way the females wait for their calves and nudge them back in the line and keep them on track. Uh, they're constantly teaching each other. And this is what makes them so unique. You actually can see behaviors that we can easily relate to. They're such intelligent beasts. It's amazing. I, uh, for those who haven't seen Secrets of the Elephants, uh, a fellow named James Cameron is among the executive producers of the series, um, narrated by uh, Natalie Portman. It travels from the savannas of Africa to the urban landscapes of Asia to uncover these fascinating secrets about elephants. And now we see you, uh, Dr. Kambu, out uh, in the field throughout Secrets of the Elephants. Uh, how do you balance your advocacy with actually being out there observing the animals you're dedicated to protect? Well, it's hard to be an advocate for these animals for no reason, right? I probably the most precious time of my life is when I'm out in the wilderness with wild animals. In fact, tomorrow I'm going to Amboseli to spend some time with elephants. Um, it's really an important way that I recharge myself. The, the advocacy is um, really critical. It has to be uh, founded on facts and and first-hand information. This series gave me such an incredible opportunity to travel around Africa and Asia and see for myself firsthand, meet the experts on the ground and, and really get a much better grounded understanding of the situation facing elephants. They are in peril everywhere. There's no population that I would say is absolutely safe. They've got so many different threats and challenges and uh, things interfering with their their survival all across Africa and Asia. Um, so having that firsthand knowledge is a very, very important and powerful part of my advocacy because I can speak from a point of knowledge having been there myself personally. Now, the fact that they're so threatened uh, is, is about the poaching. I didn't oh, get oh. that. Could you try oh. again? Oh, I don't know what that is. Um, um, sorry, uh, one moment. I seem to be having... Uh, no problem. It's all good. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why Siri is talking to me. That's all right. 
you know, <laughs> modern, modern technology, um, all part of the deal. Uh, so uh, the, the fact that elephants are, are so threatened, I imagine, is, is about the poaching. Um, the ivory market is clearly still thriving, I guess, unfortunately. Well, it's, it's, um, elephants have for thousands of years been killed for their tusks, their, their two front teeth, their incisors. Uh, at different times in their history, the populations have collapsed, and then they've rebounded, and they've collapsed, and they've rebounded. And the most recent threat to them was um, in 2012, when there was a massive poaching you know, crisis across Africa. We lost large numbers of elephants in certain parts of the continent. But there is also this uh, ground level of, or background level of poaching that happens in some countries because elephants are also eaten for food, like in the Congo. And what that means is that some of these elephant populations have been um, persecuted for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So they're very shy, they're very difficult to see, they're very intimidated by people. They are also very dangerous because they only view people as a threat to them so for while good, we were in the for country, good reason yeah well yeah exactly they and and they are so intelligent that they will teach each other for generations not to go near people and or not to trust people and you see this i saw this again and again so even in places where elephants are being protected it takes a very long time for them to lose their fear of people um, it's very sad because you can see the same thing with human beings, right? You can see the same effect of long um, generational trauma from the attacks that people have endured in various wars or slave trade, uh, all kinds of things. And you see it in animals and somehow it just makes it more real because these elephants, they can't speak to us, they can't communicate to us. But yet we see these behaviors that tell us that um, what we're seeing is maybe a reflection of what we've done to them. Very sad and devastating. I, uh, how long have you been uh, studying elephants, Dr. Kambu? Uh, clearly long enough to understand all their, or most of their communications and motivations, as you uh, as you make clear in the I, show. <laughs> uh, well, I started studying elephants uh, when I was still um, in my early 20s. And at that time, elephants were in very, very dire straits. There were there was severe poaching epidemic in East Africa. And... Um, I studied the behavior of elephants that lived in a forest. They were not the species of forest elephants, but savanna elephants that lived in forests. And I st started working on advocacy and research and combining the two things. And, and I've been doing the advocacy work ever since. I think it's so important. But I don't think anybody in the world can say that they have a, a monopoly on the knowledge of elephants because these animals keep surprising us. And that's what we found in the series, that there are things that they do that you, you least expect them to be doing. You know, when we went to Amboseli, we saw huge bulls who are known and have been known for a very long time to be aggressive, violent, uh, fierce creatures that everybody is scared of. But actually, what we discovered and talking to the scientists is that these most successful big tuskers, the big bulls who have um, young bulls who hang around with them, the most successful bulls are not the most aggressive, the most fearful or the most terrifying. They're the most gentle the most generous, the kindest. And in a way, it's obvious that everybody wants to be around the nice guys and they grow big and strong, much bigger than any of the other elephants because of that attention they're getting from the others around them. Those elephants are, we watched a big bull stand and wait for all the others to feed before he would feed. I, it's the kind of behavior you only see in humans. You don't even see that with primates. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was saying, you don't even see that kind of behavior with primates. If you watch chimpanzees, when it comes to feeding, you know, the biggest guy gets the food first. And the same with lions, the big male always gets the food first. With the elephants, the big male, he stands there and he waits for everyone else to feed. And in that particular scene, a, a family of females and their calves showed up um, when they were feeding on a big tree that one of the bulls had brought down. And this big bull clearly communicated something all the other bulls moved aside and let the family feed. It's almost, you know, it's like uh, it's like the, the best of humans, only the best of humans would do that. That's the thing is they're, you know, they're, they're almost civilized in their behavior and they're yeah. so social in their family structure, as, at least as much as human beings, maybe more so. 
it's very surprising. And I don't think um, we know that much at all because their brains are many times bigger than ours. They are just as complex, if not more so. They have very long neurons that connect parts of their brains in ways they are wired very differently from ours. It might explain why their memory is so incredible. They can memorize vast landscapes and walk on the same footpaths they used five or more years earlier. They can remember each other from the smell of their dung. You know, they have uh, an incredible memory of all their family and all the members of elephants in their community, which could be thousands and thousands of elephants. So I think that while we know a few things about them that are really fascinating, we're still just scratching the surface. It's amazing, uh, you know, to, the, the line uh, that we always hear, an elephant never forgets, um, you know, uh, and I imagine that's true. They they never forget kind uh, and generous behavior, and they never forget abuse or punishment. Um, yeah. And uh, it's fast. It was just fascinating to watch that. I think part of it, part of what maybe works against them is they're so they're beautiful, but they're also kind of, inter they're interesting looking with the trunk and everything. You wouldn't necessarily think that these beasts would be would be as intelligent and, and uh, uh, gentle as they are to look mm -hmm. at them because they just, they look so fierce, but they're not. But they it's, can be, obviously. Know, yeah, well, they obviously can, because they're so strong, they can turn a trunk from being a very delicate uh, device that can pluck a hair to being a powerful weapon against another elephant or a person or anything. Um, what I think is amazing about elephants is that as a species, they've been so successful. They've been around for millions of years. They've had many variations on elephants. There have been 12 different species in the past. They live in all the different habitats across Africa and Asia. So they have actually figured out how to survive in the most extreme and the most lush and, you know, uh, productive landscapes, which is really unusual. Most species have chosen a specific kind of habitat or environment. Elephants just go everywhere and they move over very, very vast distances. I think that um, what fascinates me um, is, you know, they're not just intelligent and they don't just communicate. They don't just know stuff from what they've experienced. They also seem to be able to read your mind. That's what I find most interesting about elephants. If you go to a place like Amboseli and you stand in, in your car and watch them, they will clearly make a decision about whether they're going to come near you or move away. And an elephant that moves away from you is, it could be just bored or it might actually be afraid. Um, but often you'll see elephants will come close and they'll be curious and they'll watch you. They'll hang their trunk over their tusk and they'll just watch you curiously like they're trying to say, I'm not, I'm not in a bad mood, I'm not being dangerous, I'm just really interested in whatever's going on over there. But research has been done where they've played back the sounds of different languages and the elephants can pick it up and they can pick up the languages of tribes that are considered more dangerous to elephants, the tribes that hunt elephants and versus those that don't. And they clearly can tell if you're in a good mood, a little bit like our dogs, you know, they can tell if you're in a good mood or if you're angry or upset and they somehow sense it. And it's pro probably not so surprising because we're all giving off pheromones and communicating in ways that we probably don't even know how we're communicating. But with that incredible trunk uh, and their sense of smell, which is many times stronger and better than the sense of smell of a dog, they can sense things that we are completely oblivious to. Their instinct is so strong um, and like you said, their survival mechanism is so amazing. That's the thing is, I imagine they're still going to be around here long after possibly mankind has um, figured out a way to get rid of himself. Um, I certainly uh, hope so. You know, um, and the earth would probably be a better place if it was just elephants and not us. But that's a whole other story. Um, uh, it seems, though, uh, Dr. Kambu, uh, that in the series that elephants, they're often kind of seen as competitors and nuisance beasts by farmers in various areas of Asia in particular, mm -hmm. true? Yeah, they are not just in Asia, also in Africa. Um, it's very hard to imagine um, a future where elephants and humans can coexist peacefully because they are very big and strong and they their number one desire is to eat. 
they need to consume enormous amounts of food. One big elephant will eat about 150 kilograms in a day. They spend 22 hours a day eating. So what this means is that if they find food because you've got a farm and they can fulfill their uh, feeding need in a very short amount of time, they will just destroy your crops and eat it. Um, this is why there are... Um, there's conflict with elephants wherever they occur, so long as they're, if there are humans in that landscape who are farming, or in some of the drier landscapes where we have uh, droughts and desert areas, elephants conflict with people over water holes, which is terrible because the elephants also need to drink a lot of water, um, especially the females with their calves. And so um, finding a solution to human elephant conflict um, is very, very difficult in part because they're so intelligent. They can figure things out. They can break electric fences. They can tiptoe around things. They can move silently, even though they're such huge bodied animals. And in some places like in India, there has been some success with figuring out ways of letting elephants, uh, leaving elephants alone in the tea plantations. And generally, if elephants aren't being harassed, shot at, bled, loud sounds at, or things thrown at them, then they will generally be less stressed. The most dangerous elephants are elephants that are highly, highly stressed. They're so high strung and they uh, will defend themselves, you know, to the death. Mm -hmm. What's your view, doctor, of uh, elephants in captivity, such as, you know, being trained for and used in the circus, which I know is highly controversial because of abuse in particular from handlers and such? Yeah. Well, the reason why elephants have been used in circuses, apart from the fact that they are Kind of freakish animals and and amazing to look at um, is because they're that intelligent that you can train them uh, but i don't know if you know much about the training of elephants it's extremely cruel uh it literally involves breaking the spirit of the elephants in order to get them to do whatever it is you want them to do so i think that is very very um unnecessary and shouldn't be allowed. And I'm very happy that many countries have banned the use of elephants in zoos. Many countries are banning the riding of elephants. Their bodies are not designed to be ridden either. I know that there are loads of elephants in captivity all around the world in zoos and circus, not, not circuses, but in zoos. And um, it, it concerns me because some of the conditions that they're held in are far too small. The elephants are in uh, environments that are not um, they're not entertaining enough for an elephant, which is an animal that needs to be uh, engaged all the time. Uh, they need large spaces. They need thousands of, of acres. So I, I actually feel quite sad about the keeping of elephants in zoos in particular, especially when they don't have a wilderness to wander about in. I know some of the zoos are changing and they're opening them up and there's a very important educational component to keeping elephants. But at, at the same time, these are social animals that need to be with their families. They need to, they they feel um, sadness and sorrow when individuals are taken away from them. Like in many of these places, when they breed them, they then separate them. There's an enormous amount of bereavement that goes on. So I have to say, I am I feel very troubled by the continued use of elephants in captivity for the entertainment of humans. I don't think we should be doing that. I, uh, I'm totally with you on that, and um, we're going to wrap up here in a in a minute or so, uh, Doctor. Just wondered what the goal is of Secrets of the Elephants, if there is a goal besides showcasing elephants in the wild. Uh, does increased public well, awareness automatically mean increased protection? Do you think? I think it's a it's a big part of of uh, increased protection for elephants is helping people to fall in love with them. It's not just awareness and understanding. It's really captivating these stories of real animals which have personalities um they they draw you in they make you feel you know they make you feel actually that's what so many people have said to me they feel sad they feel happy they feel warmth or they feel troubled and many people have come to me and said what can we do to help you know some of these elephant populations are in big trouble like the desert elephants in the um down in namibia we're trying to now raise funds through national geographic to support the creation of a corridor that will allow the elephants to continue their migration from the Atosha all the way out to the skeleton coast across that desert. If that, if we lose that corridor, we lose the entire population of desert adapted elephants, which would be a huge loss for elephants and for humanity. But I think it would be amazing if this series just got people more interested in elephants, 
more interested in supporting conservationists on the ground, the people, some of whom you saw in the series, who spend every day monitoring elephants, tracking elephants, uh, protecting elephants from getting into situations where they're in danger. Um, I would love to see this series lead to greater support for those people and those organizations. Well, Dr. Kahambu, uh, it's very important work that you're doing and uh, uh, through your phenomenal series, Secrets of the Elephants and your advocacy work, uh, your show can be seen on the National I Geographic Channel. Uh, uh, show can be seen on National Geographic Channel and streaming on nationalgeographic.com as well as Disney Plus and Hulu. Best of luck to you this Emmy season. Uh, and thank you for visiting with us at Gold Derby. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.